Welcome back, everybody, to the Gymnasio Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Hughes, here with the incredible, all-inspiring movement expert, CJ Kolbliska, and our director of programming, and someone who I'm excited to talk about sustainable training with, because it's something that we've based our entire practice on, in a way, but gone through this huge ebb and flow of understanding what is sustainable training. Is there someone that can define it? Is there a meaning behind it besides just this cool buzzword that millennials love or that trainers love to talk about because it makes them feel elitist in their style? Uh, is there someone to blame? Is, is the coach at fault? Is the client at fault when someone gets injured and their training isn't quote unquote sustainable? Uh, how do you program for sustainability? Uh, is there something missing? Is there a lack of education or is it just a new technology out there that we want to understand and dive into? That's what we're going to be doing, doing today, talking about providing our our experience, but more our kind of understanding and insight of what it is and how you can help other clients maybe, or you can maybe help yourself to unpack and discover this cool little phrase and everything that can goes with it. So get ready to deep dive into it, and I'm going to have a lot of fun talking about it. CJ, I know you will. Even this pre-show, we've been getting into all the different ways that uh, this buzzword Stand-up training is coming up on, and well, without further ado, let's go for it. Let's start with just the basics. Let's define, in the grand scheme of things, sustainable training. I'm going to kick it off right to you. Actually, I looked up a definition of sustainability before this, and that's what I typically do with words that I think I know and have a good grasp on but also I'm always curious as to what they actually mean. Um, and what, what Google said is the ability to be maintained at a certain rate or level. And what Wikipedia said is it's the capacity to endure in a relatively ongoing way across various domains of life. Sounds pretty straightforward to me. Just keep on going. Like right. That's what sustainability is about, continuing on the path that you're on and finding balance along the way. Right. Like I feel like they're going to get pulled one way or another. There may be, especially in training, there may be injuries. You may have uh, times where you've stepped away from your training, your your accountability for a bit, and then got back into it. And that seems to be the story in the, the training realm as far as group training goes and, and kind of general population training is you get going for a few months and then you fall off. And you get going for a few months and you fall off. And I think the story ends up turning into this feedback loop of every time I come back, I'm not as in shape or... Uh, I'm not feeling as confident in my movement as I once did when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So part of it has to do with maintaining your movement availability as you age um, and, and continuing to build skills. And I think you've got kind of a, a good mindset in terms of how to create an ecosystem around that sustainable training so that it provides an environment for somebody to step in and go, I can just participate and I can look back and say, look at all the years I've spent here when any, everywhere else, wherever the training I've done, I've stepped in for maybe six to eight weeks or a few months and had to come out of it. Mm -hmm. There's a crazy life cycle that all products have, all services have. You know, I like to look at it from not training and conditioning first. And I remember growing up, uh, we had the recycling bins, the blue, yellow, and green ones. That was like recycling introduced to me as a little kid. And my dad said, yeah, you throw the newspaper in the, in the blue one or whatever it was, yellow one. And they go and turn it into a news, new newspaper. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. What about the glass bottle? He had a glass bottle. What about that thing? Nah, that's not recyclable. Sorry, we just throw that in the trash. I remember going to the landfill for the first time. That's why they put them in far off remote places. Because it's crazy. Hmm. It's crazy. We just bury it. We just bury it. And I'm going to talk about burying emotions <laughs> in sustainable <laughs> training. And uh, all those different things have how tied together the mental and the physical aspect of sustainability because it's not just physical, right? Pretty simply stated. So that whole recycling thing kind of brought to this, this point, like when I was growing up training and conditioning, it was weightlifting. It was physique building, you know, bodybuilding. And it would hurt. It would hurt, you know, to get that sweet, awesome bench press and just go for it and tear apart those muscle fibers. It would hurt bad. And I couldn't do bench press at the same level for several days afterwards. Okay. So I thought about that for a second as I was going deeper and deeper into my training. Well, I'll just do a different muscle group. And I hit the legs really hard, super hard. 
and had a hard time walking downstairs. I was like, gosh, this training condition is like actually owning my lifestyle. And that just was my first kind of thought from the recycling bin <laughs> to training and conditioning. And now to hear is tapping into what you said is like, how do I continue to do this? So my lifestyle quality is, um, has a cycle, has this recycle. And the cool thing about recycling is hopefully it gets better and better and better and refined and refined and refined. So it's infinite. It never stops, obviously, until life stops for the human being. But, and that was really my first take on, like, can we do this? Because the sport world, the professional sport world, really was my influence. Work your hardest. Make the play at all costs. Get the trophy. Win. And... Um, that's not sustainable. No, that was also kind of ingrained in me too. I think in it, it, many young athletes see the same thing. Uh, you know, you watch professional sports, you see somebody get hurt and they come back out on the field and the totally. announcers are saying like, oh, they're hurt, but they're still in this, they're still going to mm -hmm. make a play or they're still going to, like they are the starting players. So they're going to play with an injury. They're still going to be better than the next, next slot, right? And then you see how the season progresses and they got reoccurring injuries and like, for me, that was just how I thought it was. Like you're gonna get injured in sport, and that's just part of that's part of the training. Like you're gonna end up feeling a little bit uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and then you may have to take some time off and like recover, and then come back, and you're never gonna be really the same. It wasn't sustainable. You know, you get so many injuries, and now you can only perform to a certain level. Like that is your threshold. For some athletes, you could be injured and still be at a very very high level, but slowly breaking down your body mm -hmm. even more so. And for me, in uh, football, I dealt with like some knee pains and back pains and just kind of worked through it and ended up having to like kind of step away from uh, as hard as, as I wanted to play because I was afraid of getting hurt. And I shifted my focus more into wrestling and mm. the same kind of things came up. You know, when I got hurt, I was like, no, I'm still good. I'm going to keep, keep training. And in practice, I'd have my right arm be fine, but my left arm would be at like 50% capacity mm. and I'd still be doing very well. Um, but I wasn't confident in my ability to do as well as I could be doing. Mm. And that kind of like ate, ate me up a little bit in the sense of like, this is just how it is. And there is no better, you know, people who don't experience injuries and are very good. I'm like, ah, oh, like you're the best, right? You know? <laughs> like, how do you do that? <laughs> and, um, in my experience, it was just deal with the pains and you'll get through it. And, um, it wasn't until I had a big shoulder injury where I actually, wrestled a whole year with it sublexed and I was like not using my left arm at all to wrestle and I was doing decent wait, wait. and then I picked the kid up dropped him down I've told the story before but slipped my arm out of place and laid on the mat and I was like I'm, I'm literally cannot move I'm in such excruciating pain that I had to then reflect on what is it that I'm doing like this is not sustainable like that maybe that thought didn't come up directly like that but reflecting right, now right. it was like this isn't gonna last and remember the doctor telling me, um, you know, you're not going to wrestle again. And if you do, it's, you're going to end up having pains still. Yeah. You could do it, but um, you're probably going to end up needing another surgery later on down the road. And, and maybe you have to like, reflect and consider for the rest of my life. Like that incidence, I had to think about, well, how do I want to move when I'm 50, 60, 70? My dad's got a shoulder injury and he's been affected by it. And am I going to be the same way? You know, I want to be able to throw a ball and to do pull-ups and to just do so with my upper body that I'm not worried about. And uh, at that moment, I think it was a matter of switching gears and saying, how can I train differently? How can I shift my, um, my practice to focus on something that will allow me to last? And I didn't necessarily have that set in stone, but I started exploring and being curious about what I could do hmm. versus what I couldn't do because of my injury and then just trying to go as hard as possible with those things. Well, wow, that story brought up... Um a whole lot of memories in myself to end where you started to start where you ended <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand sustainable training until probably a decade ago and my birthday is real soon I'm going to be 37 so 27 is probably when I first started to consider this aspect that you can you can do this and should be able to do this till the day you die Different intensity loads mm -hmm. as the body, you know, degrades in, in in a sense, but the same the same motions. Like, why can't you do an Olympic lift at ninety? Why can't you do a box jump at ninety? Yeah, it may not be a fifty six inch box jump, you know, but why can't you do yard work and you know move for, and be the person at the airport pulling off that heavy suitcase 
Yeah, you don't have to focus on the extremes. Just focus on yeah. the skill. Focus on the actual ability to do something, right. not right. about how much. Right. And back, and it goes back to high school. You know, I remember being literally laying on my bedroom floor after a track practice, and I could not get up. My lower back would not allow mm. me to get up off the ground, and I laid there. And I remember, I remember looking at the clock. I laid there for forty-five minutes until I could finally roll and get to my side. And I remember it, it was doing long, long jump. And I just landed in the sand and just felt a compression. Hmm. But after long jump practice, I had to go do sprint practice. So I ran. And it just didn't feel good. But you just do it. And then there was no inkling, no understanding of like, you should stop, tell the coach. Because the coach would be like, oh, just go hang out. Like there was no really like process for me to kind of grasp on what to do about it. I remember the first time going to physical therapy, in football, I, I, to my knowledge, my hip flexor just hurt bad. And I remember just going there and get ultrasound and icing and swimming in the pool and riding the bike. That was until it got better. And I went back to practice. And I still, honestly, 20 years later, I would have to adjust my hip. Not like chiropractically, but kind of kick your leg, kind of whip your leg mm -hmm. to get it to readjust. And now, gosh, I'm just thinking about this now for the first time. I haven't done that in... Well, to my memory, like I, I can't remember when the last time I, I stopped doing that, but I don't have to do that anymore. Hmm. But my training has dramatically changed in the last decade. That's, that's interesting, man. Just wanting to go hard and, and, and especially in practice too. If the coach does say, you know, just go sit up to the side, you're like, well, shit, I might as well just go do something because <laughs> right. I don't want to be this lame guy doing nothing. I'm on the team, right? And so you do what you can to just keep going. Well, and to try to try on first team. Like, I lost my first team. I was on second team for the rest of the season. It's a big deal. That's it's a, a big, big ego deal. hit if that yeah. goes down. Hell yeah. So let's go back to, like, I think professional sports is an amazing thing, of course, right? It's entertainment, A. But B, it's a, sell, it's a source of income for hundreds of thousands of people. But it's teaching us, at least it taught me, that there's no pain, there's no gain. Like you are going to be, I think it's like Ronnie Lott, maybe. I, forgive me if I'm getting the name wrong. But um, like NFL, Super Bowl, 49ers, the dude like cut off his finger, part of his finger. Because, I, I, fact check me guys on, on, on this one, but there is a story of an NFL player cutting off part of his finger because it hurt so bad and he just went out and played. And we're like, oh, what a badass. That's going to be me one day. <laughs> you know, like, like I'm going to have that kind of mindset. And I, I just... Yeah, it's just this, this, this whole play, and then you look at, I'm not just pick on NFL, but like the life afterwards. But when you're training that hard and that intensely, it's super sexy. I mean, you see these guys just working their asses off. But your body can't do that. And I relate it to, it's like, you got some, you got some amazing sport tires on your car, you know, or some whatever, and you just do burnout after burnout after burnout. And there's still new tires. Let's say you're young. You don't really see that a difference in the tire because you're young, you have a lot of tread left. But if mm -hmm. you get in your 30s, 40s, 50s, you're like, okay, I'm starting to see some wires. And that, to me, that's how I, that, that, that thinking is how I view training and conditioning. It's like, you can only do so many burnouts, man. You can only just punch the gas so many before those tires should be replaced. And that yeah. could be a hip, that could be a knee, that could be a shoulder, that could be a fusion of your, of your spine. Yeah, I mean, when we come up to think about sport versus training, we need to we need to understand like there's people have different whys, different intentions for doing something, and because of what we see on TV um, in professional sports, men and women, and them putting their their basically their livelihood on the line for this game, for this sport, it's inspiring and inspires us to want to do the same. Mm -hmm. But their why is very different than a, I think a general population's why. It's like yeah, I would love to be able to do those things, so I'm going to go train that way but we don't think about the things that we're actually doing in the sport of life, right? And I think that's what's missing in the training uh, and in like health and wellness through movement industry is that we need to help first the person in front of us understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, yeah, versus just what, saying, why? I'm doing this because I'm told it's healthy or I'm doing it because I wanna look really, really good. It's like if we only sit at that surface level, we're gonna end up not sustaining our training because we're not getting to the depth of, of what we're doing here and how we're doing it and why it, why it means something to us. And as humans, we're all searching for, for meaning. And a lot of times we get that through physical training. We feel like, ah, oh, I can feel my heart rate. 
uh, increasing. I can feel my breathing rate increasing. I'm sweating and the sweat equity. I'm just going to keep pushing. And we get a, so attached to a way of doing things that we think this is the one way. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times we end up following somebody else who's found their way. Right. But their journey is very different than your journey is very different than my journey is very different than your journey. And as coaches and as trainers, we need to be able to critically think and, and understand when we go into programming, what, why are we programming this way for this person? Is it strictly for progressive overload and to build aesthetic? Okay. As, long, as long as you admit it, like go that route. Yeah. Um, but if somebody's in there because they want to move better ultimately and they want to hang out with their kids and they want to throw the ball around and they want to go hike and they want to go take advantage of the physical things in life, well, when you're in pain, you're going to find any excuse to not go do those things. And it won't typically be because, ah, I'm going to go hike, but my knee hurts, so I'm not going to go do it. You just find another excuse to not go do that hike, and you end up kind of pulling yourself into this this zone of limitation that I think it's either sport or nothing. Right. And if exactly. I can't do the thing, I'm just going to stop doing the thing. Right. 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 I can't go play tennis because it hurt my knee. It's like I blame the sport for it versus not diving deeper and going, what can I do? And what do I want to do mm-hmm. with, with my movement? Like, movement is life. Legitimately. If you Legitimately, don't move, you will... You'll die. You'll it's, die. You're dead. Our body is <laughs> constantly in vibrational frequencies, and that vibrational frequency lowers, we start to die. It's that simple. And sometimes we go zero to 100. Like, right. we're like, I got to do... Either I'm doing nothing or I'm doing everything. Mm-hmm. And we think this middle ground is just not worthy. We're not, honor- this is, we're not honoring this time this space, these little pieces that we do every single day, this accountability, this consistency of just getting a few reps in or what, you know, is referred to as like movement snacks that build up over time. Like snacks? snacks? Dude, any kind of, you got to go back, go, go get a bag of chips and have like a good little bite and then go have some like fruit roll up if you want, like, you know, maybe you want to have a little bite of almonds, like you're going to snack throughout the day. But imagine if you could treat your movement that way. Instead of just sitting here and going like, all right, I got I got six hours of work, eight hours of work, whatever, and then I got to go work out really, really hard later. Mm-hmm. It's like we're training all day long, and you've said it before. We're training twenty four seven, and some of that time is sleep, some of that time is work, and a lot of that t- time in between is just, it's the in between times, and those in between times are what, what is, the uh, the building blocks of sustainability. If we do something in that time and we're just aware of it, we can reflect back, a decade later and go. I still feel pretty good. I'm still moving. I still have availability mm-hmm. versus comparing ourselves to somebody else who's a high-level athlete working out four hours a day and getting paid for it. Right. And has a $2 million budget on their health and fitness. <laughs> LeBron James. <laughs> yeah. Right. Take full advantage. You know, some people don't even make 200. Yeah. You know, anyways, did I say 200 million? 2 million. Anyways. 2 million. Yeah. And again, I love your little move, movement snacks things because if we look at sustainability across other aspects of life, sustainability in a relationship, it's not the date nights that make it win, right? It's the conversation making cleaning up dinner around the house, right? Those are the, it's not the big things that matter. They're certainly important, but that's not make it, you know, your job. Let's so say you're a software, uh, software engineer. It's not, it's, it's, the, it's the daily coding. It's not the like, oh, we finally made this new launch of, the, of, of this download. You know, like, yes, that's the end goal. That's the end goal, but sustainability is in everything. Even in how our hair looks, right? We get sustainable haircuts. You know, we don't go, it's, I don't know, I'm trying to like really kind of paint the picture that we do it in so many other aspects of our lives. Why don't we apply it towards our own physicality, the vehicle that we actually move in? Because we get it. We all get it. Finances, you know, to raising children, to keeping your house in order, to keeping your, your, your chainsaw working, right? All these, we get it. But why don't we get it, I think, as a, as an industry in movement. And I, again, I'm going to go back to and I have to, I have to say this, and this may rub some people the, the wrong way, but we are inspired by the most popular way of training still today, and it's CrossFit. And they made a sport out of it. And good for them, because it's cool to watch. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's cool brutal to watch. sport, yeah. But is that sustainable? And the answer, is, the answer is no, just like it isn't for professional anything else and you look at those athletes who do that and they know it it's very clear they even say it in interviews i don't just do this and how much time i take for restoration how much time and they use these kind of restoration words and da 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 da. but if you would really follow them 
and see and progress their movement progressions and their injury progressions and how is da 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 they're not going to be winning year after year after year. And it's like, that's very obvious. Okay, so wait a minute, and let's back that out and reverse engineer what are they doing that's not sustainable, but then what are they doing that is makes them progressively win year after year? And there's your answer. I really think about it, like, okay, so let's plug that into all the other aspects, whether it be a spin class, whether it be a Zumba class. And it's taking time. I like your, your, your movement snacks, and it's making sure that the oil is changed in the engine. Well, what's that mean to the human body? I, it, that sparked something in my mind that's, there's a lot of training out there that's a specific method, a specific technique, and you gotta do it this way. Mm -hmm. And anytime yep. you take your body through one way of doing something and you do it again and again and again, it's sustainable in the sense that you are now teaching your body to do, do this, these things, but then as soon as you wanna do something that's a little bit different, um, it's not with heavy load and faster. You just want to throw a ball and you need your whole body to go do it. And then you throw your shoulder out, but you're as strong as an ox. Like you could, you could lift some weight, mm -hmm. some serious weight and you can, you can endure it. But then you throw your body through some kind of whipping motion or you put your arm at like a rotational position that you've been avoiding with lifts because it's going to hurt you. Now you've hurt yourself doing it with two pounds, lifting your milk jug into the back of your car. And like, ah, it's easy to write it off of your past and just like, this is, this is how it is now. This is, mm -hmm. this is my life. Um, but as coaches, we can kind of reflect back on it and say like, what method have you been doing or te technique have you been doing so consistently that's brought you to this point? Because you're going to fall into these attractor wells that your body now can subconsciously um, or unconsciously move through these patterns and it's becomes second nature to mm -hmm. you. And as soon as you step out of that attractor well to do something very quickly or you turn your head to, to back up in your car and you're like, oh, I kinked my neck a little bit. These little things that are little uh, uh, pains, discomforts, like those add up over time. And we don't, we haven't been taught how to reflect on those later on in life and to say like, how did I get to this point? It's just, this is just how it is. What we get to see in this industry and in this facility is multiple methods, multiple directions of movement and very, uh, or a lack of limitations on how to do something. It's much more explorative playful, curious, um, kind of building this, um, uh, this experience to become more human, which is just to play with stuff. It's to like, it's to discover and learn about ourselves through, through play and through socializing. And, you know, it's not for everybody because not everybody cares about sustainable training. Some people just care about lifting faster and heavier. And some just want to explore movement skills, acquisitions, and doing crazy flips and stuff and right. more power to you. But that's not for everybody, and I think general population really needs to needs to see where they're going to train. Is this like there's one way to do things, and is the um, the conversation that's had like don't do it this way, or is it much more open and saying I want to see how you do it? And it's a it's a funky conversation because we've been told like you're especially as like a physical therapist, you got to go a certain route, you got to do a certain protocol, you got to go a certain way. And if you go out, step outside that protocol and somebody ends up getting hurt or somebody ends up doing something that you didn't want them to do because they weren't ready for it, that comes back on you. But we need to take responsibility, self-responsibility for our actions and say like, whatever you tell me to do, I can tell you no. And I can ask you questions or I could just do it. And if I do it and I get hurt, whose fault is it? Is it yours or is it my fault? It's our fault. You didn't set me up for success. Maybe I got a little ballsy and wanted to kind of push a little bit harder. But then we, we need to shift this conversation of like, you did this to me or I did this to myself and go like, how can we learn from this? Mm. How can we continue to learn about ourselves to move in better ways? And what I mean by better is just have more access to our sphere so that we're very aware of the space we take up versus the space we don't take up. Like we're kind of just like locked in here in our body, um, you know, what's in front of us and what's the side of us. But if we, as soon as we start to explore what's above us, what's beneath us, what's around us, we start to become more confident in our abilities. And now we want to explore more because we're starting to gain more access into our experience. Mm. And I think that's, that's really what, where we need to kind of shift this, this understanding of sustainable training is that it is about being curious. It's not about not getting hurt. It's not about avoiding injury. It's not about, um, he said, she said, and this is how I'm supposed to do these things. It's mm -hmm. just consider all these pieces and know that life happens. And if you choose to play a sport, you will get hurt. If you're going to play it hard, right. you're going to play it fast. You're going to play with the best people. Ch your chances of getting hurt are pretty high. It's like, if you're, you're going to be a soldier and you're going to go out to war, the chances are pretty high of you getting injured or something happening to you, maybe even losing a life, but you step into that knowing. 
I think people going into sport just assume, again, that that's the way that I need to train because this is how everybody else has done it. But if we start to consider life as a sport, we start to realize, like, yeah, there's dangers, but there's also things that can expand our experience and expand what, what we're able to do. Gosh, man, there's a lot in there. <laughs> we, yeah. I <laughs> love it. Play that one back. Uh, um, so uh, I want to I hit on a few points. Um, a, there is no such thing as injury-free. Right. I would want to hear that. Injury is not about uh, if it happens. It's about when it happens. And I even mm-hmm. say that to members coming to our facility in Gymnasio. You will get a ding. You will get a little bit of a, something just bugging you in our workouts from our programming. And here's why. Your body is not perfectly balanced, and our programming is not perfect mm. because we are not perfect. But here's the issue. It's not about if, it's about when. It's about what you do about it when it happens. And doing nothing about it is a sure fire way that you will not come back to this facility and we will underperform and undervalue you in every way possible. And you're going to go to the next facility and the same thing's going to happen. I'm very straightforward with it. I don't say it like that, but you know, I'm very like cut, cut and dry. It's about you communicating to us and us communicating to you. And in, even in my movement assessments, I actually say this every single time. It, I hope it's not getting old, but it's like, my name is now Sherlock and your name's now Watson. And I need you because I'm going to look at movement and collect data, but I can't feel what you feel. I can see what you can't feel because your body has been accustomed to it. Right? It's that attractor well, that subconscious movement pattern that you think is um, you think is normal, but it's not. It's just common. And common is not normal. You know, common is common, but normal is actually balanced, right? That's, just, that's the sustainability side of it. So I said, I need you to tell me what feels lack of confidence. I need you to tell me what actually bugs you. And don't try to perform your best. Perform what you are. And that's really like set down the ego and let's just collect data on how your movement is today because it's going to change tomorrow. And if we can see little discrepancies in how your hip translates left to right or how much dorsiflexion you get in that ankle or the confidence level that you feel in that thoracic spine when you spin left or spin right then we're going to start to unpack and start to build from day one a sustainable um, partnership because i'm going to give you drills to kind of expand your knowledge expand your range of motion and then as you go into this workout you're going to meet with goose you're going to meet with cj and it's not going to be be, be me but you got to tell them the same thing. And that, I love that's like, it's creating that, that ecosystem. As I say, you have a, you have a tremendous ability to collect truths. Like you're, you have, you have one of your strengths is input and it's like collecting that, those little data points that you're not judging. you you may be recognizing your judgments, but instead of like having to do something about it right now, it's like, I want a bigger picture of what's going on with you, with the forces of nature, behaviorally, what are you experiencing? Is it painful? Because pain's different for everybody. And also your lack of, your, or not lack of confidence, but maybe um, you're doing some kind of movement that you've never done before and you're there to help guide them and say, like, it's going to be okay. Versus like you take one or two steps and you think those two reps, now that was it. You're not going to be able to do it. It's like right. those are your first two reps of taking a same side rotation lunge. Listen, it's weird. You're going you're gonna to learn how to use that space. But um I think what's so powerful in, in, um, as an MDMC and seeing you collect those truths and then me kind of shifting how I perceive those truths too and how I reciprocate um, what I see to the individual that's in front of me that I'm training is that we can't solve everything right now. And so that ecosystem helps to set somebody up for success because we know things are going to happen. We don't know when, we don't know how. But at least we can observe how you're moving right now so that when stuff does come up, you go a little bit harder or a little bit heavier. And maybe you don't injure yourself, but now you're experiencing DOMS for the first time. Mm-hmm. And you're, it's three days later, and you're like, why can't I lift my arms? And you just did pull-ups for the first time in six years. And they don't, they're, they're unable to reflect on like, oh, yeah, I did pull-ups because it happened a couple days ago. You're now, that happened on Monday, it's now Thursday and your arms still don't lift and it's getting worse and you're like, oh my God, my life is ending, my arms are broken, I need to stop doing this now. We're there as coaches to kind of help understand this process Mm -hmm. and these novel experiences, these things that you're going through, because we've collected so much of these truths from other people's experiences, we're able to help foster a relationship that is sustainable. It is It's opening a conversation saying, let me know when you are feeling something that you don't know what it means. We don't, we, we probably don't know what it means either, but we're going to be there to say, let's watch how, let's observe how this 
plays out. Right. And I mean, how do you kind of approach that whole ecosystem? And you've got somebody who's maybe new to three dimensional movement in terms of like doing intentional transverse plane, frontal plane loading and twisting and swinging when they've heard in the past that swinging and twisting is bad or whatever. How do you approach, let's say a newbie coming in that's yep. play movement illiterate, movement lacking some movement awareness and this, like what potentially comes up in those movement assessments or in their first few months of training that you help to dictate, um, I shouldn't say dictate, I think to guide the yeah. experience. Yeah, I like that. I think for any, any person who works as a movement professional in any capacity, you know, uh, I think the one thing that we're all shooting for is to educate. You know, just people just don't know enough. Um, and I like to say, you know, you need to know just as about as much information that you know on how to drive a car and the, and the laws of the road. If you can have that much knowledge about a vehicle and the laws of the road, if you have that so much about the physical human body and training, you're going to be just awesome. Mm. You're going to be good enough. Because that's what the body needs. The body does not need perfection. It needs good enough. And I've, I've said that to a lot of people. They're like, What? What? I was like, yeah, trust me, the body can operate amazingly on like 50% co- 50% capacity. If we only use 10% of our brain and we're this good, <laughs> I mean, we don't need a whole lot to rock and roll. So it's the educational piece, and it's really taking people into this to the story, this understanding that there, like I said, there is problems that will come up, and it's okay. It's how we communicate about it, but it's really taking that first step. Like when I take someone who's brand new, it's like, and I love our movement assessment for that because it takes them into new territory. And they're like, why am I doing this motion? It's like, trust me, man, I'm looking at all the joints stacked together, the body balance, da, da, you know, it's really, there's an awesome why behind it. But it's, um, it's, it's the educational piece and to tell them that the body describes, show, model, that the body is designed to do these motion patterns. Like the back is designed to twist the lower back. The knee is designed to twist. I'm going to say all these things that people are going to freak out I'm on. I'm cringing. You know, <laughs> it's designed to do that. And I'm saying it in a very plain and simple way because I'm not telling you what type of rotation. I'm just saying rotation. Or how much. Exactly. And if you restrict, and I say like if, you're, if it's that person that comes in restricted and doesn't have the, the capacity to use that motion pattern, it's just going to go somewhere else. The body will do what you want it to do, how you need it to be done without thought, without conscious thought. So how do we train it to do it subconsciously? And it takes practice. And that's what I love about this whole, what I was drilled into me in football, like you will play how you practice. So practice well. And it wasn't this whole practice makes perfect, it's practice makes permanent. So what are you permanently doing in your body? And then also to go back with any sort of newbie, and I always have to ask this question. We don't call them newbies, by, by the way, people, but just, just <laughs> the, con- the, the, the conversation is I want to know what their past injuries were because that sets the stage. Now I'm going to bring it back to a little bit more mental here, right? We all have a, emotional baggage. I'm sorry. Our parents were not perfect, and we're not going to be perfect parents, but we got it. And that we're just doing the best that we can. I bring emotional baggage to my marriage, and my wife has to deal with it. Is it her fault that I get pissed and triggered when she says something wrong? No, it's my fault. I need to change. I'm not going to change her. I can change myself, though. Training conditioning is no different. I want to know what baggage you're bringing to our relationship. Mm-hmm. I'm saying it in a fun, in a fun, fun way. Because that ankle that you sprained 17 times throughout high school vo- volleyball is not a good ankle. You may walk just fine, but the injuries have memories, and you're bringing those memories in with you. And the way that you're going to do that lunge step to a jump pivot awesome move is the same way you're going to do it here that you did in, in high school. You don't know that, though. I don't know that either. So let's unpack it and let's discover it. Because I really want to think, like, the, even though the pain is gone, the dysfunction is still there. So any one of you that got a serious, nasty injury, like my lower back issue, I still live with it today. And I'm now conscious enough to, to work with it and constantly be snacking on it. I think that's, the, you know, snacking on it, snacking on it. So it's really having the education, understanding their past, their past is, bring, is still with them, that the injuries they walked in through the door with, I hope we can continue to understand and work through it so they don't walk out with them. Because we can do that. We can reverse. Like the founding of youth, we found it. It's called physical training. 
<laughs> it's really cool. Hence the podcast. Um, so that's the next piece. And then the last piece is move. That's the next piece. I need you to get out there. I need you to start getting your body to start progressing through these patterns that are literally unlimited. That's what I love about what, what, what we do. It's like, yeah, we, we, people really, they don't really complain. Other trainers like, hey, you guys do a lot of programming. Like, how do you sustain that? So well, there's a lot of motions we have to get better at. So if we don't, if we have 50, oh boy. You know, we can get good at those 50, but we really have 500,000. Oh, man, you brought up like, some cool things. Um, I'm thinking just different age ranges and different walks of life, what sustainable, st- sustainable training looks like. You know, somebody who comes in who's 55, 60 years old, and they come in with those past physical traumas, emotional traumas, whatever it is, it's going to show up in your movement. Like we, we are not a physical being separate from an emotional being separate from a soulful being like those, those all come together. Preach it. Yeah, exactly. Like seeing somebody who hasn't done a box jump in maybe 15 years and to put a six inch box out in front of them and say, okay, step up on it. They can step up like a stair. As soon as you ask them to jump many times, it's like they go to jump and there is no jump. It's like, Mm -hmm. whoa, what are you doing to me? It's like jump up there. Or do the best you can. And it's kind of like a leap. Yeah, it's one it's a literally leap, a leap yeah. of faith of like, <laughs> I hope I can get up there. And then what it, what it brings up is a conversation of like, so, you know, they, sometimes they say like, so why couldn't I jump? Like may, they could not leave from two feet and land on two feet. It was like one to one or maybe just a step up. And what it comes down to is there's probably something that's happened in your past physically that's stopped your body from taking flight. You've stopped running. Maybe it was you were running and you rolled an ankle, and you're like, oh, every time I try to run now, it hurts. So your body's afraid to leave the ground. you got to be mm-hmm. connected. And so it can bring up these emotional states or these intense physical experiences because you haven't faced this in years. And it's our job to say, well, is this something that they need to be able to do? Yes, we should all be able to jump. Right? But whatever the case is, squat, a lunge finding depth and enhancing the capacity of what you're, what's available. But if there's something that's not available, you can't take flight. What happens now in real life when you have to be able to react and like run out of the way? Are you going to run out of the way and then like be in excruciating pain? Mm-hmm. Is the adrenaline going to take over and you'll be fine? We don't know those things. But it's just like if you, you, know, if you have a broken seatbelt in your car and you never wear your seatbelt and you never get an accident, you're never going to know the power of that seatbelt, the power of being able to do something or to, to have access. Now, you do wear the seatbelt, you do get an accident, you do get hurt. Did that seatbelt save your life? You still got hurt? It's like there's a, there's a spectrum of, of progress. Great. Nicely said. Yeah. Right? If you, you, maybe you can't jump on the box, but you can leap on it. And we can t- continue to progress, progress into better and better leaps. Maybe not in height and progressive overload, but just in your confidence and your ability to do that if you needed to. Right. And it's not all about that, but that's like maybe somebody who hasn't trained in a long time and then they go to try to do something like, I can't do this because of something that happened years and years ago. Now, what about the somebody who's in great shape? They've never been injured, never broken a bone, never experienced any kind of big physical trauma, and now they're 20, 25 years old, and now they're, they're like, I am so in my peak right now, and I just want to keep performing. And so their sustainability, I think, is just growth, 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 growth. But then they hit that point where they get injured or they pull a muscle. What now is the next step in their journey? Are they just going to rest and then come back thinking they were just as good as they were? Because that's what happens most of the time. That's what happened to me. It's like, oh, I got hurt. Take six weeks off, get back. And then you're like, oh, damn, my performance has gone down a lot. And now things hurt and I'm avoiding them. What people tend to do is then stop doing those things. Mm -hmm. And so they're not in pain anymore. But then something is asked of them in life to do those things and the pain comes up. And we we have a moment to reflect here and say, as, especially as coaches, we can recognize these moments and say, that seems like it was a traumatic event. And not saying it like that, but just recognizing it as this is a moment that we can retrain our body to do, to have availability in. And I think we just need to be able to consider those things and have that open conversation of, what are you able to do? What are you unable to do currently? And what do you what do you wish you could do? If you didn't have any limitations, what would you do? That's one of the questions we ask. Those are great if, three questions, by the way. If you were in any pain right now, what would you do? Yeah. And a lot of times it's, I would go on a hike. Mm-hmm. I'd go on a run. I'd go play rec soccer. Dance. I'd, yeah, yeah. It's like, I got that one I go swimming. I go surfing. Yeah. It's like playing in life. We're not, very rarely do I have somebody say, like, I would like to be able to, if I was out of pain, I want to be able to squat 225 pounds. It's usually some kind of action in life right. 
some kind of activity that brings joy. Mm -hmm. And without the ability to do those things, we now have this mental real estate that's taken up by this fear. And that can eat us alive and cause more dysfunction down the road and even push us to do things that are more extreme that will hurt us even further because that's what we know. Yeah. Fear of pain is a real thing. Gosh, it's a real thing. Um, I've seen hardcore athletes, as they would call themselves, and I would see themselves. When I want to do a double, a jump, right? Two foot takeoff to two foot land on a six inch botch. And they look at me like, okay. Because they're... The, mem- the memory, the emotional connection, physical to mental, is still there. It's cr- it is crazy. I'm getting, I actually have tingles right now, like to break through that. And it's not a forceful break, right? I mean, not use that, that word. It's opportunity. It's, yeah, exactly. It's opportunity. Because it's not what they can't do. It's what they can do. Start with success, right? The, that, the adage that you and I have been drilled in with is you start with success. Mm-hmm. Always. Always. Because once you've reached that first mental roadblock you may not come back. It's very tough to learn nothing about that thing you couldn't do. Right. They may exit your program because mm-hmm. of that mental roadblock. Ah. I think it's in group training too. It's, it's tough because you may have a big group that 60% are very capable of certain things. And then the other 40%, you know, you got to make a modification. Mm-hmm. Who do you coach to those 40% who can't quite do some of these things that you have in your program that then the other 60% are like, ah, this wasn't too bad. This wasn't too, too tough. Where do you coach those 60% and then they have those 40% feel unsuccessful? How do you coach to all of them? And that's what's most important is Let's, let's dive into this, the soul. Trainer of, Mr. Trainer Trainer and programmer of pro programmers. Um, how do you do sustainable training in group training? It's good. Yeah, yeah that's I mean, it, a good broad question. Give it five, ten minutes. You know, really, you know, like mm-hmm. how, do you, how do we actually do it? Well, you got to consider who... Who is the demographic that you're serving? Because some people maybe, uh, maybe you've got a group of 10 to 15 year olds, <laughs> your, your kids, maybe it's PE. Mm-hmm. Um, for my programming, I've, we've got a demographic that goes from um, youth athletes all the way up to 70 something years old, 80 years old. 80, yeah, yeah 80. 80s. And that's um, a big spectrum to consider. What is, what is, what are we capable of? Um, and I think it's simple things like we have to locomote. We got to be able to travel from A to B. So what are the simple breakdowns of locomotion? It's like a lunge or it's a squat or getting just from one place to another. And so you have for that demographic, right? Yeah. And and you've got, then you can change it to running and more impact, but there's also the spectrum of lower impact levels and still being successful to walk. We got people who are walking with a cane and they're afraid to go for a walk for more than five or 10 minutes because it's painful. Hmm. So how can I set them up for success in positions that are just like walking without the impact of walking? Because walking is still impact. And if you're walking inefficiently and you've been walking the same way for years and it's continuing to take you a path towards a path of degeneration and dysfunction versus regeneration and exploration of like, what can I do now with this? So as a kid, you just keep exploring. But as soon as you hit that injury, it may stop your exploration. Mm -hmm. So I want to provide a position and maybe an an intention in an exercise that somebody might question going, I don't know if I can do that. And then set them up for success with that by having them do it, try it out. And I'm going to find out where that threshold is. If they can stand, they're going to be successful. If they can't stand, I'm going to find something they can sit on and they're going to be successful. Right. So, so taking a demographic focus and then applying uh, movement patterns of daily life mm -hmm. and putting them into a, into a perspective that that demographic can fit. That that, that they can relate to and resonate with. Like, I'm not going to make them do a bunch of power cleans because that's, not the they're not the, what they're there for. Right. Maybe if people want to come in and do power cleans, I'm going to make sure that those power cleans carry over to something they do in real life. I don't want them to get better at power cleans to get better at power cleans unless they would just want to get better at power cleans. Sometimes just like an ego thing, like, hell yeah, let's load it up. But specifically for movement availability, mm-hmm. I, want, I want to put them in the positions like standing, stride stance, put them in positions with their feet that maybe they haven't, they haven't even questioned before so that they are experiencing something novel that ignites that curiosity in them of like, why am I doing this? And why does it not hurt me? I was told that exercise, or I've experienced exercise that just hurts me. I'm going to put them in a position that just gets them moving. And they're like, oh, this isn't too bad. I'm going to say, all right, speed it up. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I'm breathing hard. And that's, that's the joy of programming is putting somebody in a position or in a movement pattern or in some kind of exercise that they haven't 
experienced before. And I want them to see themselves grow in that exercise. Maybe the first time they did it, they felt kind of awkward doing it, but it didn't hurt. It was successful. Hmm. Maybe they did it and it did hurt and we modified it a little bit and that one didn't hurt. And they're like, wait, there's ways to modify exercises in such a way that I can still be successful, still get a workout, still get the benefit, but doesn't make me feel worse afterwards. In fact, I feel what people talk about in exercise, which is these happy hormones and the runner's high. And I just felt good. And I had a smile on my face. Like that's what I live for as a programmer. It's just setting somebody up for those novel curious curiosity experiences of like, so what else? Like that's, we kind of refer to it as the Kool-Aid. Like, all right, I did some weird stuff. It was a really easy workout. And two days later, I like experienced soreness and muscles I've never felt before in my life. I'm like, yes, just continue. So I want to just interrupt you real quick. So you're, I'm trying to take your genius of what you just said there. And so what CJ is talking about, and forgive me, you can correct me, is what's called group level one. Mm-hmm. And essentially, that's our G1 level. And we're talking about, a, I'm going to say this again, I've said it three times already, a demographic of people. It's not a one-size-fits-all program. So how are you going to train sustainability for a group training program? You have to divide out your population. Yeah, to account for people that you can serve. Right. Just scale your program. So right. that's not going to make it easier necessarily because that, that has its own connotation to it. Because it's it may be easier for the that level two that's a little bit more advanced and can do impact work, and now they're doing like quick steps. And like, that wasn't too bad. But for somebody who hasn't done a lot of walking or swinging or moving their body in three dimensions, I want them to experience that in a safe environment that I don't say, hey, watch out. Hey, don't do this. Hey, don't do that. I'm going to say, do this, do this, do this. Try this out. Let me know if it's uncomfortable so that you don't, you don't just leave here going, oh, that didn't, that sucked. Like I'm here to help guide. Mm-hmm. And we have coaches who are here to help guide. But you have to use us as a resource. We are a tool for you. We are serving you. You are serving us. We're learning from your, from your movement so we can serve more people. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I'm going to provide you with some um, tweakology or a modification that will show you that you are 100% capable of doing something that you may not have thought you were capable of. Yeah. And, um, gosh, uh, simply put, right, the way that we program for small groups, like, you know, we make it simple. We even use simple terms. It's called strength day. And it's called cardio day. You know, we've really gone back and forth on that a little bit because it's truly not that. You know, like right. it's, it's, we sneak in stuff. But, but the, human, um, the human athlete, uh, the daily athlete that we serve, they think of things as strength or cardio or, or stretch. That muscles right. or my heart and lungs. Right. It's like, well, all of them at exactly. the same time. But. So in our group training, it's for, especially for, for trainers that I, I hope you can glean something of this. And like in our strength days, there are cardiovascular moves. In our strength days, there are mobility moves that really are not that strengthy, but you put it into a complicated multi-plane pattern and you don't need much weight at all, at all, at all, at all. You ever held, held a two pound dumbbell and a rotational overhead press to the side? Ew. You're going to feel your entire body work. Right. So it's really crazy. So it's really kind of taking this, um, you know, the way I, the way I look at it and I like your two cents on it is there's movement right? There's straight up movement. You know, that's just literally walking, squatting, putting on your, on your shoes. Uh, then beyond that, uh, there's strength in that capacity. Mm-hmm. Then there's power in that further capacity. And then there's endurance in that capacity. And then that all just ties to the sustainable cycle that it goes through. So I just said five different levels. You have to be able to move. How strong are you in that movement? Can you add speed to that movement? Can you reduce speed but add longevity to that movement? And then can you cycle through that for eternity? Hmm. Right, you know. Um, yeah. And that's how we program. That's how we program. Again, we don't go in that necessarily thought process every single time, but we understand that those are the components, like the raw ingredients. Oh, gosh, even bigger than that, even macro than that. And if you don't kind of have that framework and built into your program for group training, then you're going to be underserve others and overserve others. And you'll just won't have as successful as a program as you think you will. I'm not ruffling feathers. I mean, I'm yeah. going to ruffle feathers with that one. I'm sorry, but you know, it's it's really, um, man. You can't serve everybody. Well, I mean, you know, in one's workout. Yeah. If you think about how many ways can you do an anterior lunge, I will give you a 24-hour presentation on anterior lunges. <laughs> you really will. I'll, and and yeah. they will keep going. Like it's going to get exhausting. So bring some beer. Bring some food. Yeah. 
on Bring a couple memory cards. Single cars. anterior lunge, yeah. Just an anterior lunge. That's called forward lunge. Everybody just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> forward lunge, yeah. Because that's just one of a million things and more that you can do. And like you said, you can do an anterior lunge and you could do it for strength. You could do an anterior lunge. You could do it for power. You could do an anterior lunge. You do it for speed. You could do it for endurance. You could do it for agility, accuracy. I mean, you but now right, you could yeah. do it with any piece of equipment. Mm-hmm. And don't be limited by your equipment. How many ways can you hold that piece of equipment? It's going to dictate a whole other experience internally. Like if you always do an anterior lunge with a dumbbells on your sides, so forward lunge, and you're doing walking lunges, farmers carry. What happens now when you just lunge forward and turn your toe a little bit inward? Oh my God, you're going to get hurt. Don't do that. Don't turn your toe out. It's going to hurt you. Why will it hurt you? Because you're unaware of how your body's going to respond when it hits the ground. Mm -hmm. And if we can set people up for that experience, not tell them all the different ways you can do it, but just start to gift new ways or opportunities to do that lunge, maybe your forward lunges always hurt you. But it's not the forward lunge that's hurting you. It's how you're doing that forward lunge that's Mm -hmm. hurting you. Where is your mind? Maybe there was something in your past that came up from doing a forward run, and like I don't like going forward anymore. It hurts my knee. There's so much that comes up and just when somebody says, I can't do that, don't make them do it. Just find other ways to put them in that exact same position and take away momentum, take away the speed, take away the load, give them a supportive surface. Like there's endless ways. And if you can recognize that as a coach, you are doing sustainable training because you're not just adding variety for the sake of variety. You're bringing variety and opportunity in there for somebody to explore what they can, what they had no idea about before. And it's, it's what really what sustainability, I think, is, is igniting that curiosity and that fire and recognizing when something goes wrong or something unexpected happens, to not react, but to respond to that, learn from it, grow from it, so that next time you come back after you've healed, if it was a discomfort, what's different? And I, I, have, to, I have to say something, because the passion of why we're speaking this way all comes from an educational source of a, of a methodology of methodologies. I like to say that, you know, we are specialists of specialties. We don't follow a dogma. Gosh, not even close. If so, you wouldn't last year. Maybe we're just blind to it. Mm, nah, man. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> if we're blind, don't tell us. <laughs> but if you want to connect with what we're talking about, you know, I, I have to say this because we're about giving. You know, we have a course that's called Multidimensional Movement Coach. It's a program. It's a mentorship, actually. It's not just a, co- a course. It's a mentorship. If you want to understand how to do a 24-hour presentation on an anterior lunge, take the, just take the course because <laughs> we want you to know it because we want you to be able to do that, not because you want to do the presentation, but because I want you to be able to think and know how to think, not just what to think, how to think, how to take everything that CJ said brilliantly in a sense and just say, I have that, I have access to that capacity so I can selflessly be the best trainer that any coach, any, me, any athlete that comes to me would want because that's what we're here for. It's, just, it's this, this whole aspect like we want to be able to continue to train and condition our coaches, excuse me, our athletes, our clients forever. Why? Because it's good business. Flat out, it's good business. And what's good business to your business is also good to your clientele. So I love this industry. I love it. If you're successful, then you're taking care of people. It's like the biggest self selfishness in the whole thing and the biggest selflessness. And I'm stealing that right from Gary, Gary Gray. Thank you, Gary. But it's really that huge aspect of the more you know, the more you're gonna kick some ass. And not in the, the not in the like, let's go crush and go to war. It's like, let's just keep going. And let's make fun little bits and little mountain peaks along the way. But there's another valley, because guess what? You're human. And you, I don't know, I, I ha- had to say that because it's, I don't want people to just look at this like, wow, these guys may know something different than what I know. I want you to know a lot of different things. And I, I have to plug this. I have to plug this, and I've, I don't think I've ever done this on this podcast before, and plug another podcast, but the Knees Over Toes guy. <laughs> I, li- I don't know who he is, but I would love to meet him and be on a podcast with him, the case is. But he said something about research, and he said that there is more financial dollars going into kin- uh, kinesthetic research on acceleration training. I, he gave me the number, and I, I, I want to reference it, but um, hundreds of millions of dollars and how to, how to research the human's body capacity to accelerate. Hmm. And there's like a quarter of that amount, research dollars grants, going into how to decelerate motion. Wow. 
And I, I'm a, I, I, there's a podcast he he says it on. I listen to it. I want to have the numbers because I want to be as you know as uh, truth telling as possible here. But it's true, right? And that's what goes back to like I want you to understand that like we are so focused on the horsepower of our engine, we can give a rat's ass about our brakes, <laughs> and that's not good for race car driving. And so it was. I want you guys to get. I'm trying to say these simple little pieces to kind of make it make it. You know, what does sustainable training mean? What makes a difference? Why do my Why would my clients care? Why would my business care? Um, how do I really expand my capacity as a movement specialist? And uh, there's all these different kind of ways to think about it. But if you really want to know, check out the multidimensional movement coaching program. It's a mentorship. We dive into six months, and so you get access to CJ. You get access to me. You get access to my entire team quite frankly. And if you want to kind of progress the knowledge of what you're doing, it's there for you and we're here for you. And it's a big deal. And uh, hence why we're so passionate about this whole process. Um, there's a, we can keep on going. I, I always like to 24 say 24 hour podcast. Yeah, let's do it. Ooh, <laughs> hey, on the end here. Wait lunch. a minute. That's a good idea. The whole world will watch. I mean, we could do like a <laughs> relay, you know? Oh, tag team. Yeah. A little, a little tag go. team. Keep the conversation going. One person hops in, gets the, gets spun up. We could get a whole ring going, like WWE Ooh, style. Whoa. Okay, if, you, if you're Smack listening to this and you want that to happen, put a comment on this sucker. <laughs> wow. Okay. Any any other thoughts? Any any kind of closing? Like you know, you have, you've, we've chatted about this long. You know, anything's like you know, I have to say this it hasn't yeah, been said yet. Definitely. Um, I defined sustainability earlier to what Google said and what Wikipedia said. Um, what it really comes down to, and I mentioned like the human experience, is that like sustainability is that that is realizing that our own health is intertwined with the health of this planet. And if that much money, like for example, is going into acceleration training, that that is shifting us towards just like push, push, push more, 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 versus like being able to decelerate and knowing how these two play together and how we train our bodies is going to influence how the rest of the world. Uh, interacts with us and how we interact with the world. And if we're able to recognize our own individual way of sustaining our movement and our mindset and our ability to experience this life in its entirety, not just set limitations and walls up for ourselves, but break those down, pull the veil back and just be with our experience and know that there's nothing good or bad, right? If I get injured, it's not a bad thing. It's an opportunity to learn. If we can treat every opportunity like that as an opportunity to learn, we will be going towards a more sustainable route as, as humans. But we have to do that in, on an individual basis and the people that we, we serve and work with. We can't just assume that we know what sustainability is because we're living right now. Hmm. And later on in life, we'll be able to reflect back. Like, ooh, was that sustainable? Well, we're going to find out. So talk about it. Share it. Express it. Like, what does sustainability mean to you right now? What does that look like in your in your life? Reflect on that. Or are you doing those things so that when you are older, you're able to sustain a certain level of function? If you're not working towards that and you're doing things in your life and having um, habits and routines that are pulling you into a dysfunctional, degenerative state, that's not sustainable. You're sustaining your dysfunction. You're sustaining the the your death, your downfall, mm -hmm. right? We're all going towards a similar point, which is death. But how are we sustaining our experience and our, and our vitality in this experience? I think just be curious. Be okay with playing and doing weird stuff. Hmm. Support each other. Take it. Well, again, CJ, thank you very much. I'm Michael Hughes, Gymnasio Podcast. I have a, tr a client to go train. So this is a good end. I love it. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. We'll be back for more and more. We're out. Peace.